<laughs> yeah, so a very warm welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, also a very warm welcome to everybody who's joining us online. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, we're very grateful to the Bridge Computer Society um, to host us here today. Um, this is our second Black Social here. It's also our finishing, concluding event um, of the Access All Area exhibition. And today um, is all about virtual practices, hybrid practices. In fact, we've got three prolific speakers that we will introduce shortly. Um, and before we do so, just a bit about Item Flux for those of you who are reasonably new to us and who might not know us. Um, and then we will talk a little bit about the format of the night. Um, so before I get started, just a bit about me. Oh, the clicker is working. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I am one of the three co-founders of Item Flux. Um, my name is Olive Kingrich. Um, I'm a curator, an artist, a researcher. I'm currently a lecturer um, at Greenwich University. Um, my research interests are all about participatory art, so this idea of interactive forms of art. I work a lot with visual sound and with holographic installations. You can see one of my holograms outside. Um, yeah, and um, there's also a really strong interest in my practice in exactly the subject, so in hybrid um, uh, practices. So I've just recently um, published a paper on this that is going to be published at um, Leonardo magazine. Um, well, it's coming out this October, actually. Um, yeah, and who are we? So Alton Flux exists since 2016. Um, we have um, initially started at the Lights of Soho Gallery in Soho. Um, we came together with this idea of founding a community or creating a safe space really for artists to exchange ideas, to discuss um, their objectives, to share their knowledge, but also um, really to build um, a bit of a support network for each other. So um, yeah, over the last years, we've done this quite successfully. So we've started with 35, 36 different artists, and now there's about 3,000 artists who are all interconnected who um, yeah, are linked um, to each other through Art in Flux. Um, what we're trying to do is with this platform, not just to connect artists with each other, but also to connect artists to the public and also to public institutions. So we have a lot of different partners who we've worked with, the Computer um, Art Society, the British Computer Society um, are two of them. We've also worked with the VNA, with um, Barbican, um, Lumen Art Projects, and these are just some of the partners that we've worked with over the last years. Um, yeah, one of the partners is the National Gallery X, um, which is also where we're having our next event um, that we will talk about in a bit. Um, with this, I'm gonna hand over to Maria. <laughs> Thank you, Ole. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for being here today again. It's so nice to be back at physical, even although hybrid to uh, events, as uh, this is how we started in 2017. And, 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 and although we kept through the whole pandemic, we kept doing events, virtual events, there is something you know impossible to replace from you know being in a room with, with everyone. So that already Makes me, makes me happy. So for the ones that you don't know me, I'm Maria Almena. I'm a, a creator and founder at Art in Flux and also a creative director at Kimatica Studio. I explore the intersection between interactive technology, live performance and the human body in order to create transformative experiences. Um, I've got some artworks also outside, uh, particularly my new work with augmented reality performances that I call Metaverse Divinations. Um, and yeah, and also a 3D Pinterest sculpture that you might have seen <laughs> over there. So I'd like to uh, start by presenting the social. I mean, this is uh, is one of our socials. And um, this is how Art in Flux started. We started with our Flux social events because we just wanted a place for everyone to come together and to socialize. Simple as that, right? But we wanted to uh, uh, for it to be a place where people, artists, practitioners can come to exchange ideas and to support each other. We felt there was a lack in, in London of a place, a hub for like media artists. Um, and, and we wanted to also like kind of have the control of it and not, that, not be independent of like organizations where we could be flexible, we could be free and we could just exchange, you know, however we please. 
So um, we, uh, yeah, as all you have said, this is the second uh, flag social we are doing here at the British Computer Society as a wrap up of our accessible areas exhibition. But this is always a way if any practitioner or artist is interested in coming to uh, or joining the flag family or coming to our flag social is always like the best uh, entry point um, as we, is when we are more flexible and we're open for people to uh, uh, ask questions or share anything they like to share. We also, as the three of us, we have um, our own in, uh, curatorial interest. We decided to also do some uh, curated talks. And we've done many throughout the last uh, four years. Um, and they are always curated around the, our uh, particular, uh, the themes, um, our particular interests of, of, of themes. And we have, uh, our, the last curated talks have been happening with the uh, National Gallery. Just before the pandemic, we got a residency with them and we've hosted seven events with them. Uh, they always, they all have been online. But actually, for curated talks, we thought it, it, the format it worked quite well. Um, so we've done um, yeah, run uh, events on, on heritage, on health, on transcendence, on ecology, on gender, and on data. So all these events, they're actually at the National Gallery website and also in Art in Flux website. So if you want to re-watch them, uh, they, they are there. So they, you know, the, the legacy is stays on the, those platforms. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to us. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. So very, very pleased to be here again with you all socially. Um, very <coughs> nice. Um, so I'm Asha Shemza. I'm Creative Director of Art and Flux and also um, an artist myself. I make light sculptures um, and I'm also the manager of the estate of my grandfather's works as well. Um, and for Jalal Shemza. So you'll see some of my works in the other room. I have a keen interest in the interactive and participatory artwork. Um, and yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about our personal practices and how our works have changed really in the last couple of years to have this hybrid practice that we'll be talking about a bit more. So Art in Flux, we not only wanted to bring media artists together and also and connect media artists with the public, um, and institutions. We also wanted to connect the public and with media art and make media art and digital technologies accessible to everybody. So we've been bringing in young people um, to do workshops with us to learn about how you make media art um, and doing curators tours, demystifying what it means to be an artist, so professional practice, um, how can you survive as an artist, what you might want to do, if you're in A-levels, maybe you want to do foundation art, maybe then you want to go to university, maybe you don't want to do that, you want to do something completely different. So thinking about all those different ideas of professional practice. <coughs> um, and of course, um, exhibitions is really important as we're all media artists, we want to showcase our work. So we've been producing um, exhibitions in real life <laughs> um, with all sorts of different technologies. So VR, AI, body tracking, um, a EEG, um, using EEG monitors and do it, we've worked with, so here we've got the Event 2 exhibition, which happened at the Royal College of Art and was in collaboration with um, the Computer Arts Society. This is a lovely work of Paul Friedlander here, who's in the room today with us. Um, it's a and, dancing wave, uh, it doesn't just stand still, people have seen it in action. <laughs> yes, it's kind it's of very kinetic. <laughs> And we have Andy Lomas's work at the top here um, at the VNA, and William Latham here with the VR work um, at Event 2 as well. And then in the last couple of years, we've also started doing virtual exhibitions. So we have um, Chris on the, on the call um, virtually, who designed our Art in Flux Reclaimed exhibition. Um, so he'll be talking a little bit more about that, and we'll go a little bit more into how we, what our process and how our journey through doing that, because we, we didn't know how to do it um, two years ago. So we've learned and grown. We want to share that process with you. So now I'll hand back over to Olive to talk a bit more about the actual event. Yeah, so we have three <coughs> fantastic speakers um, lined up for you today. Um, Tanya, who's here in the audience, and with Chris McGuinness and Danielle, as we're um, who are joining us online. It's a hybrid event. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, before um, inviting the speakers to um, talk about their practices, we thought we're going to share a bit about our own practices with you and the challenges that we face as Art and Flux, but also as individual artists. Um, yeah, and just a bit of context. Um, since I mean, ever since um, the, this idea of hybrid art started to emerge, and Tanya is going to talk a lot more about that, so this idea of net art and the journey that um, we've been going through, there's been challenges also around how to make this art accessible, right? So how do you create virtual experiences that actually translate the physical into virtual world, or maybe um, are something that are larger in some of its parts? And so there's questions around grammar and language and education and how you navigate these new experiences. So um, yeah, hopefully we can deconstruct some of these challenges today and think about together and exchange ideas um, also with your own experiences in this context. Um, my personal experience as an artist, um, as I said before, I work as part of an art collective called Analima Group, and we work, we're interested in visual sound experiences. And actually we had a, a residency also at National Gallery X um, just before the first lockdown and were thrown in a bit at the deep end because I think the 20th of March um, in 2020 was supposed to be the kind of launch date of our exhibition and that was the first day of lockdown. So we had to very quickly reconsider entirely how we're going to present this exhibition to the public. Mm -hmm. And um, it was supposed to be a virtual, uh, a virtual, a real light experience, completely <clears throat> massive. You're surrounded by the lights and you're stepping into this kind of cone of light and our experience is some of the paintings within the National Gallery as color harmonies, as a visual sound experience. Um, so obviously this wasn't really possible and we had to um, reconsider and come up with, um, in our case, it was a 360 visual sound piece that works both um, on your phone, but also with VR headsets and that is accessible to everybody at home. So for us, this was quite a challenge because we have never worked in that way. We're all media artists, but to translate a physical artwork into a completely virtual experience, yeah, it was more difficult than we thought originally. Um, what worked really well was suddenly it became accessible to everybody at home. So this was the first time in over 75 years that the National Gallery was closed so that the doors were actually physically closed to the National Gallery. And people at home were able to just experience the piece um, from, from the comfort of their sofas. The challenge for us is that when we think about new media, we're not necessarily considering everybody. So especially people who are um, with accessibility needs, right? Is as um, of abled um, artists is sometimes something that you don't immediately think about. And so we, after creating these three art experiences that were really successful and we had thousands of visitors, um, we kind of took a step back um, to think how we can make these artworks accessible. And so that's something I'm doing right now and working with RNID and the National Gallery and, and redesigning these experiences and to think about facilitation of these artworks and how to make them accessible um, to, to people <laughs> with accessibility needs, and in this case, visually impaired. Um, also with Art and Flux, we had um, our starting point was um, our very first event at the National Gallery, Gender Tech, which was uh, themed around gender. Begita was exhibiting as part of this. And we didn't have any experience in putting on a virtual exhibition at the time. So it was a very new field for us. And um, this was our very first virtual exhibition. It was essentially a glorified website. And mm -hmm. it was the starting point for us to think about how we can make these um, exhibitions a little bit more than just a two-dimensional interface. And with that, I'll hand over. Oh, Is that, that your slide? Oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so this was our second, our second um, a virtual exhibition, and this was more three-dimensional. So this was for Ars Electronica, um, building on um, also an event that we did um, at National Gallery X. And here, this is, was the first time that you could actually navigate through these spaces. And it's a bit similar to the exhibition layout that you can see now as part of accessory areas. So you navigate through the space, you have the ability to zone in on different artworks, you can watch videos, you can see three-dimensional artifacts, and obviously it's a very different experience from just watching um, a, a website, essentially. So this is the part, the first starting point of our journey. And yeah, we've evolved quite a bit since then. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Um, so yeah, I, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about my practice as a, as a, a media artist that 
I've been mainly focused on performance. You could imagine that going digital or going virtual, it wasn't the most straightforward thing to do as it literally there are two worlds that are like the opposite to each other. So um, I got some research funding from Arts Council to think about this and to see how could I virtualize and digitalize my uh, experiences. And obviously I do performances working with technology working with real-time interactive technology, one of the first challenges that we saw is like real-time interaction in the virtual world still is quite, you know, there, there is no, basically technology is not quite there just yet. <laughs> and um, so there were already like so many restrictions and I hate restrictions. I'm an artist. I like to, you know, to be free and to create and to, to you know, to see what is possible. So sometimes that's when like, working in technology, it could be a bit um, challenging. So I'm going to briefly talk about these two projects. I'm maybe going to start with the one here, which is Simulacrum. Um, basically, this is Schematica's first ever performance, and you can see the image on the very top. That's just a photo of a live performance. We're using body tracking technology, and you create you know, like it is a, a, a photo of a live performance, but it has a digital feel to it because you have the projection, right? Um, and then when we were uh, doing one of the events with the National Gallery, we were putting together a virtual exhibition and I was like, how can I translate a performance piece into the virtual world? So that's when I created this uh, piece. Uh, so this piece is the first time that I used photogrammetry. Photo um, and basically, I digitalized. Um, uh, that was actually myself. So I put myself in the costume, and then I just like took um, many photos around around me on a still position because that was the first. I, at first, I wanted this to be uh, a movie, uh, a virtual uh, piece, but obviously they had too many too many challenges. So we were like, okay, let's just start with the basic. Let's just get a representation, a physical representation, a virtual representation of a physical still performance piece. So that's what we did. And then also, uh, this is part of our reclaimed virtual exhibition. And basically, when you, uh, you it's, a, it's obviously a 360 uh, virtual piece, so you can go around, which is quite nice. We added lighting. I mean, Chris McKinnon uh, did this. And then we created this sphere, which is in the middle, which actually, you can walk into it and then you appear into a live, per a, the video of a live performance. So I was like, okay, that feels a bit more performative, you know? So that's how I kind of like went around that piece. And then what you could see here at the exhibition is just a 3D printed piece of that. So it's like how I've been moving, you know, I think this is for me an example of a truly uh, hybrid practice from a live performance to a virtual, a virtual piece to a sculpture. Um, and I will keep developing it, uh, actually. Well, so the other one that is Metavertigination, we basically develop a 360 body tracking rig uh, to uh, digitalize the live performance, but also we need to calibrate it with the augmented reality software in order for the visuals to be a map to the, to the body. So as you can see there, I mean, I'm going to pursue it. I mean, this is just a gift. If you want to see more, there is, you know, documentary about the whole thing online. Um, but just, I don't have time to explain more. But yeah, basically the, the whole idea is that the visual are created by the present and the movement in real time, but they are all maps. So if the, if the, if the performer moves to the right, the visuals move to the right. Um, believe it or not, I mean, that's a challenge that needs to be solved. Um, and then now we also have the possibility of moving the camera. So you can also move the camera around the performer, meaning that you can do total immersive virtual reality performance experiences. So I'm quite proud about that one. <laughs> we'll keep evolving. Um, so yeah, Reclaim, I think for me so far, this is probably my favorite uh, virtual exhibition we've done with Flux. It was uh, supported by Arts Council of England too, and it was launched at National Gallery. And it's also Reclaim is related uh, to accessible areas in that it was the first uh, exhibition that we were exploring accessibility and how to also like champion underrepresented uh, artists. So um, you, uh, it, the, the, the virtual space, it was designed by Chris, and I wouldn't go too much in the details because he's gonna explain more, but just conceptually, I wanted to explain, we call it Reclaim. We were inspired on the 
um, Occupy Square Movement and Black Lives Matter Movement as an idea of like reclaiming a, a, a space like Trafalgar Square that is usually is pretty impossible to do uh, an art exhibition unless you are like, you know, really selected. Oh, and then we were working with the National Gallery, but we were not allowed to exhibit with the National Gallery. So we were like, okay, how can we reclaim, a, you know, a space to be close to that so we can occupy virtually? And we actually quite liked that, that idea. And we intended to continue this idea of like occupying different squares in, you know, next to the main big institutions as a way of like reclaiming visibility for um, artists like us um and just to finish off uh, the only thing i want to say about this that as with my piece with many of the pieces you have different levels to it you have for example with uh, olive uh, piece it's a brainwave uh, visualization but then when you walk into the piece you activate it and you see a sound you hear a sound piece and a visual piece so it's like yeah the idea of like meta you know, artworks within artworks which i quite like about this one Oh, I forgot. <laughs> so this one, it was, uh, we did from the other art fair, and we used Can Matrix, Can Matrix, which is the same platform that we used for the first one and the same platform that we used for the current one. Um, we liked it, but in this one, we include already 3D objects, um, which is obviously a, a bit more complex, but we liked it this, we thought it was like quite a simple way of translating physical like, exhibition into virtual exhibition, keeping the format of the walls and, and, and you know, like the idea that you journey through it. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to leave it there. And I'm going to pass it over to a friend. Yeah, time, time, time. I'm going to go really quick. Yeah. So <laughs> basically, um, my practice, I make light sculptures normally. So in the other room, you will have seen an infinity cube and a lots of light bars, which is the global warning piece. So those are my artworks. So the first thing I did was I had all of them made in 3D. So by a 3D designer in Cinema 4D. So she recreated all of my pieces in um, virtual space. So that was the most basic thing I could do to translate the object um, into the virtual world. The, so that was great. So you can see the object in the virtual world, but it doesn't interact with you. And a lot of them do. These ones don't, but a lot of my works do interact with you. So what I then needed to do was bring some of the artworks into interactive game engines. So this piece is in 3JS. <laughs> Uh, which is also shown in the reclaimed exhibition. Actually, I don't know if that actually does interact, but in other pieces I've been doing with the Shems of Digital exhibition and artworks, you walk up to the artworks and they light up. So, I mean, it's not quite as though it's light, light, but you know, it's got that sense that you're interacting with the piece. And as Maria mentioned as well, there are these ways in 3JS as well that you can walk up to something and it takes you to an interactive painting app. So that's mm -hmm. to do with the artwork that I've got in there as well, which is a screen that you can scan and it takes you to a painting app and then it projects that onto the screen. Maybe you've had a chance to have a go on it. Um, so very, yeah, that was very quick. I'm just going to move straight forward because <laughs> we don't have much time. So an access all areas here is a physical exhibition here in the space and also a virtual exhibition. And we've done that. We've used quite a lot of the same um, pieces that we've had kind of scanned in and made virtually for this show. Um, and for the computer arts, so I'll just rewind, I've gone too quick and I've lost. <laughs> We've also got in this collection, which we're really excited about, is a new selection of limited, well, it's a, it's just a unique prints um, that are from our Art in Flux artists. And we have created these limited edition prints as an archive collection from Art in Flux. And then these prints are going to be donated to the Computer Art Society's public collection. Um, so we're really excited as a way, Maria mentioned about reclaiming a space in um, Trafalgar Square and occupying the square and those kind of things, but um, being able to endorse and create that connection with our artists from historically excluded groups um, to now be part of such a major computer arts collection is really fantastic and exciting for us. So you can see those hanging. Tomorrow I'll be packaging them up and shipping them off to their new home at the Computer Arts Society. So very excited about doing that part of the event. And of course, we've also got our hybrid version. So you can see here, as Maria mentioned, it's using this Kunst Matrix platform. 
So um, if it's very easy and simple to use, um, so it's very quick and easy. So I myself, I do a lot of the web design and things for Flux and the newsletters. So I'm able to populate this very easily and straight. So whereas um, with Reclaimed, we needed the wonderful expertise of Chris McInnes, who will talk a little bit more later, um, to actually get that working in 3JS. Um, whereas this is quite easy, it's a drag and drop situation, so it's quite an easy thing to get started with. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up. I think I'm just going to introduce our speakers, if that's okay, and there'll be a chance for Q&A um, mm -hmm. at the end. So, but we will let you to do, you will let you ask questions to these speakers as they go along, if that's mm -hmm. all right with everybody. So, Danielle, we're so pleased to have you here. Um, I'm just going to introduce you. So, Danielle Greatrich Shirley is an artist working in animation, sound performance, <coughs> and video games to communicate the experience of being a Black trans person. Their practice focuses on recording the lives of Black trans people and um, entwining lived experience with fiction to imaginatively retell trans stories. So I'm going to leave it to you to um, take it away, Danielle. Thank you so much for joining us from Berlin, I believe. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hi. hi. Um, can you let me share my screen, please? Yes. Oh, can you not share it? Not currently while you're sharing, no. Okay. Just give us one second. The perils of a hybrid event. <laughs> Sorry, just give us breathe in and out. Just be patient with technology. <laughs> Make host, yeah. So. Make host, yeah. We have this one. Make host. Yeah. We don't want to make. Yeah. yeah, he said we all speakers should be a host and then they can share. Oh, I'm a host now. <laughs> I think we need you to give that back to us if that's okay. But um, <laughs> for now, that would be great. Thank okay, you. Okay, so hi everyone. I hope you're doing well. Hi. Um, my name is Danielle Brathwaite Shirley, and mainly what my practice is about, if this presentation works, there we go, um, is about archiving. And so I, I'm showing this image here. Uh, it's because it's the image that's foundational to my practice. It's an image of someone called Mary Jones, um, who was a black trans woman in 1836, if I'm getting the date right. Um, and this is the only recorded archive of her existence, as well as some testimony she gave in court. Um, and it's a poster warning people away from her. And so the first thing that I wanted to do um, as part of my practice was to archive Black trans people in the present um, using the kind of technical ability that I have uh, to try and ensure that they're not erased from the archives and that their stories are told from a perspective of a Black trans person rather than th archive through the violence that kind of erases them. And I'm uh, greatly influenced by older video games. So this is Blade for the PS1. And at the time, I thought that when uh, a representation of a human was in a video game, that that human actually had to get physically scanned and a bit of the soul was placed inside of the game. So every time you were very bad and that they died, part of Wesley, uh, Wesley Snipes would die because <laughs> Wesley Snipes played Blade. Um, and that this has kind of stuck with me. And so I've always kind of loved this older aesthetic this very rudimentary 3d aesthetic this is the mentee in the ward for the 3d uh, for the ds and so this like very low poly low fi aesthetic has really drawn me towards um building work ar around this low poly low fi uh, way of building and it's a much faster and iterative process to do it like this um as well as this is the game called this is called Mawillo. this is by muriel tramis it was made in 
1987, the same year Super Mario came out. And this is a game about uh, Martinique and a tale in Martinique. And so I just include this here all the time because I want to show that games were trying to archive stories from the perspective of people of color since the dawn of games. But um, there was a point where entertainment became the main kind of focus. And so what do I do? So mainly I work with um, people to basically translate their bodies into a 3D environment and try and tell their stories through a kind of digital um, environment. And so I build and construct the, the entire environment around them. I texture the world with images of them. And I'm just gonna play you. I might have to reshare my screen just to make sure this works. As you can see, they sent me a video of them singing, um, and so I used the video of them dancing and converted it to Um, and as well as that, uh, to usually to test out new technologies, I make music videos. It's something that I always do. I don't know why, I just can't stop doing it. Um, but I put this in here because often people ask me like, what technologies do you use and how did you get into them and did, were you taught traditionally? And I, I wasn't for these, uh, for tech. I taught ev everything myself. And the way I do it is that I try and not to put too much pressure on the first initiation, the first greeting of that tech and just have a bit of fun. So this is the music video I made. Now I love stuff. Um, and so that was using this, uh, essentially I was testing two programs there. Um, one was EB Synth, which uh, uses AI to um, take a frame of a video, allow you to draw over it and then interpolate how the other frames may look. So it starts looking like a painting, as well as something called Virtua Cam, which allows you to use your phone as a camera in 3D spaces. So you get a more natural kind of, um, kind of holding camera state. Anyway, so I'm gonna go on. So I'm gonna go to the first kind of exhibition I did, which is my end of school exhibition. Um, if this presentation loads which looks like this. Okay, and so I show this because this was the last exhibition I did that was, there was no interactivity in it. Um, and the, the main point was talking about trying to wish that I could um, dig up and speak to black trans ancestors. And so it was like a dream essentially that I had. Um, but someone told me in this presentation that they really enjoyed my work because they can just take in the visuals and uh, leave all the um, things I was talking about behind. And I hated that. And so after this, I decided that I wanted to make uh, games and have people have to activate the work to get something out of it. And I feel really strongly about art no longer being passive and requiring people to put in work to get something at, out. And so the first game I actually tried to make was called Resurrection Lands. And it was based around esports. Um, and I, I'm a huge esports fan because I'm just a nerd. I'm a huge, huge nerd. And so the idea of the game, which you can play at resurrectionlands.com, is um, it's it's how to explain it very quickly. <laughs> um, the idea is that if you could scan the earth and bring back memory, memories buried within the earth and have those memory, memories become sentient, what would happen in our day and age of um, kind of tourism of identities and how may those identities be exploited and those people in the past be exploited for uh, companies gain. So that was the aim of the game. Um, and it's the remake of it because the original version I made and you will all know this when you try and make an interactive work for the first time was terrible. It was so bad that when I showed it, 
everyone fell through the earth and <laughs> no one was able to play it. And it was awful. It was the worst experience ever. It's basically a game that was a mess. Um, <laughs> and so I had to remake it. And I, and I love to talk about this because I don't think we talk about the idea of remastering a work, remastering tech works often enough. Um, something that they do within the gaming world is when they love a piece of work that is too old to play now, they remaster it for a modern audience. And I really think that often when we're building work with tech, the skills that we've learned along the way allow us to look back at works that we made in the past and actually create the vision that we initially wanted. And so the first version was terrible. I made it in Blender Engine and I remade it uh, in JavaScript uh, and made it an FMV game and it works so, so much better. Um, and so I, I really think it's important to think about, at least from my perspective, to think about how we approach tech and how we also approach um, revisiting tech and not letting it go and die. And so the next work I made, oh, and this is the install shot of the, of the piece. Next work I made was we are here because of those that are not. Again, based around this image, but this was to be an interactive uh, Black trans archive. So essentially, the things I don't like about archives is that often they're very inaccessible. You don't know what essentially you're looking for. If you go on an archive, it's very hard to find something that might just interest you. And um, there's a huge problem with archives about misuse of material. And so in this archive, the first thing that you had to do was choose your identity and what identity you chose determined what you would see and what you had access to and how you treated the archive um, made the game either longer or shorter, depending on how nice or bad or whatever uh, you were. Um, and so this was a turning point for me because it made me realize that um, not the work isn't just the, the work. The work isn't just the art. A lot of the art is in the audience's choices and the choices that they make. And you, I personally get a stronger satisfaction when the audience leaves thinking about what they did and the responsibility they have for what they saw rather than that work was really nice. I, I really like them leaving with something in their heart. Often people tell me I made the wrong choice and I'm, I'm thinking I didn't program a wrong choice. So I don't know what you're talking about. But like that reaction is really nice compared to someone just looking at my work for five seconds and saying that's a nice painting. Yeah. Uh, and these are some in store of these demon, I call these demon babies. So there's a lot of like physical and digital things um, kind of merged together in my work. I, just, I like doing this quite a lot. Um, something that I found, I spend like 13 hours a day in front of a computer. So it really is nice to have some physical practice as well. <laughs> um, so <laughs> this is something that came in later, but I really actually do like to kind of um, blow out these uh, digital works into a physical realm. And I think it's one thing, okay, I'm, I am rambling, but one thing I will say is that I really consider um, digital works or digital spaces as different mediums. So I consider JavaScript a very particular medium, Blender a medium, all these things. And so when I make works, I list out the programs I use because those are the mediums that I use. Um, and I feel that often we talk about translating a work into a digital work. But for me, I don't think that works because you're not respecting the separate medium that it is and, and that you're working with a whole new medium. So it probably needs a whole new thought process and you're gonna create something amazing, but just in a completely different way. And you don't need to do a translation. Um, you need to try and I guess, learn the medium or look at the medium as a medium. And I don't think we ever talk about digital spaces as mediums. We instead talk about them as ways in which we can show and disseminate work and disseminate ideas. Mm. Um, try and get on faster. How how am I doing for time? We got like two minutes left. Okay, we got two minutes left. I'm gonna run through it. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, a couple minutes. Okay, two minutes left. <laughs> Last presentation. One of the games. Oh, early games. PS One. Spider Man. Okay. <laughs> um, this game really fascinated me because. There was a fog on the bottom of the ground and they made this because of a rendering limitation. They couldn't render a whole city on a PS1 game. So this fog kills Spider-Man and the excuse is basically there's a fog. There's no reason it needs to be there. Uh, but for me, the Black Lives Matter protests were going 
about when I was revisiting this game. So I imagine the fog was being made by the Black Lives Matter protest as an atmosphere that only supported black lives. And so Spider-Man died in the fog because he's not black. And so I made a game about this um, in order to commemorate my friend's passing. Um, and so I made a game about the bottom of that city, essentially, and about a city changing to accommodate particular people and what it means to go there, have a particular identity and have this atmosphere become harder or easier to breathe. Um, and you can go and play this at blacktransair.com. Um, and quickly speaking about the domains, domains are super important because I feel like it's where you get to claim space on the internet. Internet real estate is a huge thing. Um, and I, I know Instagram is great and all, but it's not your space. It's someone else's space allowing you to market and having domain names that are easily findable as well as like easily linked to each work. So I have Black Trans C, Black Trans Air, Black Trans, um, Black Trans Archive, allows you to kind of carve that space out for yourself for your own uh, for your own community, so they can easily find the things that you're doing, so that you don't get lost amongst the algorithms that try and essentially suppress you. I think that's all my time I currently have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle. Oh, you can't see me. Um... Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful presentation. Um, I think really fascinating to me and interesting is the idea and concepts of the blender being a medium, you know, that these tools, the JavaScript is a certain medium that, um, I mean, I was talking about translating a physical work into a virtual work and there's, mm. and it sort of loses something, you know, and when we were doing the works for the reclaimed exhibition, we were then creating them in virtual space, mm. using that virtual world as our media, you know, like I thought that was really, really fascinating. Um, and just the way that you move between these, these worlds as well. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Oh, there was maybe two, maybe afterwards. Or we do them after? Yeah. 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 I think okay. Very, yeah. Okay. I think we're gonna we'll we'll come back. Thank you so much, Danielle. Amazing presentation. I'll pass over. To... Do I send the hosting back to you? Oh yes, yes please. please. Who to art in flux? Uh, oh, no, you got in... it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's two art in fluxes, I think. Oh, we've got it. Yeah, we've got it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just quickly yeah. going to introduce Tanya. So um, Tanya is a, is a PhD student at the University of Greenwich and um, exploring the evolution of cyberspace in the net art practice. Um, her thesis working title is From Net um, to Art, the Conceptualization of Cyberspace Within Net Art Practices. Tanya graduated um, with an MA in Contemporary Studies and Duration at Westminster University um, and was working at the Tate Exchange at Tate Modern. Um, and now Tatiana um, is teaching at the University of Greenwich um, on digital studies. So without any further ado, thank you. Yes, forward. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> All right, hello everybody again. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my project and about net art. So the project. Uh, so the working title, Spatial Aspects of Net Art and its uh, exhibition practice and um, the way sort of started with understanding what is net art, sort of what are the early stages of net art and that how it moved, how it changed over the time. And that's why you have sort of this chapters at first, the, the jokey one that definition is not found and I will explain why. And then we go to the early stages. I will talk briefly about the early stages of uh, net art and moving to post the internet and then web is back and basically web, web is back. You see it's what I didn't plug state with this exhibition where it's a hybrid space. You can look at it online and then you also can experience it in the physical space. And uh, what I found out during my research is that net art, even though it started as strictly digital movement, it's moving towards hybridity. So you can see a lot of uh, physicality within it and sort of Within my research, I'm trying to understand why is it and um, what are what will be the best curatorial practices to show this type of art to the world, so everybody can understand it, everybody can participate with it, and uh, so on. And then I'll briefly talk about one of the case studies I'm 
using for my research, which is the wrong. I don't know if you've heard about the wrong Biennale. It's quite an interesting uh, project. It's been, I think, around six years and it's gradually progressing with a lot of artists participating in it. So we'll start with the reason why there is no definition. You can first talk about the idea that net art itself is quite problematic terminology because we can call it internet art, we can call it net art, we can call it art on the web. There are a lot of terms that you can use to explain this movement. And the reason for that is that internet is still progressing. And because net art was born on the internet, it's also still progressing. For example, if we talk about Renaissance, you know, the beginning and the end. So you sort of can form it, you can put the frames on it, you know, you can answer the question, what is Renaissance? But when we talk about internet art, you don't really have frames. That's what I found out over a few years of doing this research, because in my first year, I was like, oh, yeah, I know what is internet art. And then second year came and I was like, I don't know what's internet art anymore. So it's progressing. And uh, of course, the reason for that is technology, because internet is changing. Now we have, we are used in exhibitions a lot. So do we say that we are artworks? Is internet art? Or do we, you know, do not put that in that category? That question is crowding. Then, of course, we have history with the idea of web 2.0 developing social network all coming into play and then suddenly net artists are not interested in technology that much but in the social dispute that is surrounding the internet so if we talk about the early stages of net art um, and the first movement was called net.art you can start talking about the idea of programming so the artists were really playing with the coding language this work, for example, from Mark Neptier is called The Shredder and basically probably can't use internet here. Or can I? I don't know. I, I bet, think. okay, I bet not. Mm -hmm. So basically, <laughs> <laughs> it's still working. You still can use that artwork, which is amazing. You can still play with it. And if you put any um, address into the search bar here, it will shred the website. You should be able to <laughs> take and put, make Google search, for example, look exactly the same. And all for the those few years of the internet growing, it was all about how we can manipulate the net. And the internet art was very easy to sort of to give terminology to because it was literally one computer, another computer connection in between. And if that connection working, that's internet art. But then 2006 happened where we have the idea of post-internet art forming. And that's all about suddenly social media. The internet stopped being novelty, everybody using it, you know, MySpace came into play, YouTube came into play, so suddenly everybody can go on the internet, socialize, it became all about me, some people were talking about the internet is dead because creativity has died on the internet, so there were a lot of theories about that, so artists thought that we can change, so the artworks became more about um, protest, social ideas, how you can use internet to critique society, what's wrong with society, how we can change it for a greater good, and so on. And another interesting factor is that physicality became a, uh, present in internet art works. As here you can see RTV, sorry, Mir Kant. Um, his artwork basically at first he creates it on his computer. Uh, and then he makes a sculpture out of it that he places into the physical space. So suddenly we have this hybridity forming. But then, as you can see today, hybridity moving even further. So it's not only about artworks that have both physical and digital. And one of the reasons was, of course, to show it broadcast to a bigger galleries and museums, but it also becoming about independent platforms, creating online exhibitions and what I think is great that finally public is okay to look at those online exhibitions from their screen and perceive them seriously, not just like, oh, well, another, you know, mm -hmm. thing. And we have a lot of them. Of course, pandemic gave a huge burst. And for me, it was the crisis of my PhD because I thought I have an answer. And then pandemic mm -hmm. happened. And then everybody started to do online exhibitions. And I was like, no, guys, no, okay. yeah. let me at first finish my <laughs> research. But now I have this huge information. <laughs> Everybody is doing online exhibitions, and I'm even more confused about what is internet <laughs> art, which is not helping at all. But finishing on, yeah, I think you're absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the case studies. So I'm looking at further fields. Probably you heard of them. They're amazing centers. So if you're not, do visit them. They do great projects. Uh, Arbeid and the last one is the wrong, and they're called 
the wrong Biennale. And the idea is that they just position themselves against the Venus Biennale. So they're all online. They have some exhibitions that are shown in physical space. But the idea is that it's an open call. There is no, it's quite democratic if you want, because you know how Vienna Biennale works, right? Everything should be up to pristine. Eh? We only specific artists get there. Where with wrong, it's open call. Anybody can send um, the request to be part of the program of the wrong Biennale. It, and then it works as normal Biennale. So it hosted for three months and the website itself works as sort of this huge hyperlink, as I call it, because everything is hyperlinked. It's very um, normal for 90s, but I think not normal for today, what we perceive as a normal internet website, because it's quite chaotic and that it's all about links and there's not about, not, not a lot of intuitivity in where you press and how you go. But uh, the idea is that they create embassies, uh, digital embassies, where they create artists and then also assign a curators. And then the curators are free to do with their embassies whatever they want. So you can have normal websites where the artworks are shown. You can have virtual exhibitions or online exhibitions as Art and Clouds did. Or you can also have Metaverse galleries, which is now the main point of my research on gathering data on the wrong, because I'm trying to understand, first of all, what's the most used type of the gallery now? Is it just a normal website with artworks? Or is it the online gallery? or also how you measure metaverse galleries. And when I talk about metaverse galleries, it's when you build the world from scratch. So you don't have your normal traditional walls of a gallery space sort of put into the 3D into the lights where you absolutely build from scratch the universe. Like, you know, in computer games, the maps. And then on their maps, you put different artworks and you jump, you navigate with them, you sort of take part in this sort of game-like gallery metaverse space. So then the main question now I'm left with is how you measure them, how you understand the artistic creativity within that, how you make it more accessible to people to understand, to navigate, not to get confused by this new form of art. And yeah, and again, of course, the overarching question, is it all net art or, you know, what is net art? <laughs> and on this confusing point, mm -hmm. I'm probably gonna stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Ask the questions, yeah? Yes, yes, let's do after uh, questions afterwards, but uh, you awaken uh, yeah, so many more questions <laughs> to be a word of it. Yeah, very interesting. And, and also, it's, it's fascinating to see how, yeah, when, when you started your research, you know, and how, like, obviously the pandemic it has been, you know, it opened up like many more possibilities in the virtual world because also a, a lot more people were using it, but uh, many more investments were yeah. thrown into that, into that world. So, so yeah, it is um, yeah, very fascinating. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your work and your research. Now we are going to go to the, our last speaker, uh, Chris McInnes. Chris McInnes is the designer who has designed the Reclaim exhibition for Art and Flux. And he is a British American artist, technician, and programmer raised in Sheffield. He uses a mar myriad of technologies and technical skills to unpick, poke, and test the complex planet planetary networks that bind together universal facts and local phenomena. This is really beautiful, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Makinas has used game engines, server deployments, multiplayer environments, physical computing, web scrapping, and AI to tag at the, at the mesh world of a network world. So if we have you uh, there, Chris? Yeah, I'm here. Um, Hello, Chris. You, you cannot share. Uh, so somebody has to stop sharing their screen, I think. Yeah, I think. You need to make another host. Yeah, it's all weird because we made a host as a. Ah, so. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm, it's good now. No, it's good now. Oh, yeah, great, great, great. I can, I can do the thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Give me, give me a sec. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, this, you see, this will stop it. Yeah, that's fine. Blah, 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 share. Okay, cool. Can, can everybody see that? Yeah? Yeah, perfect, thank yes. you. Yes. All right, um, I'm, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm, I'm a, uh, oh, actually, I'm, I'm gonna start my timer so that I know what's going on. 
before I, right. Yep, I'm Chris, I'm a AV technician and um, computer programmer and also artist. Um, I sort of bring all three terms kind of along in the same thing because I um, I spend a lot of time working in galleries not as an artist of it, as a, as a kind of labourer and the sort of work I see myself and other technicians do is so creative and um, so obviously artistic uh, and is very rarely recognised as such. Um, on a daily basis, we are bending and breaking the rules of what you are supposed to do with technology in order to help other artists realise their projects. So I always include, consider that as, as part of my artistic practice and part of the artistic work I do is making other people's work um, sometimes just installing it and sometimes from scratch. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of uh, 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 projects where I've been a kind of programmer or a technician on it. Uh, the first one I wanted to share was um, something I did, I guess, quite a few years ago during the pandemic. Um, Arbeit approached me and asked if I could develop a VR exhibition for them. Um, because they had, in, they had been organizing this show with the National Gallery of Zimbabwe, um, but then, you know, traveling anywhere uh, became quite difficult. So they came up with this idea of making a VR exhibition that they could then at least send the headsets and then, and then people, the exhibition became more mobile, but also meant that it could overcome the sort of border restrictions that were in place at the time. Um, and so this involved uh, the, Nash, the National Gallery in Zimbabwe sent me um, floor plans, uh, scale plans, and, and I modeled the whole gallery space um, that they would have been showing in, in Blender and then built it up into a VR um, kind of experience in um, Unreal, I think, if I remember rightly, I think it was in Unreal. It's quite an interesting one because um, it's generally quite ill-advised to use loads and loads of videos in um, game engines. It's not a very efficient way to use game engines and you generally shouldn't do it, but that was, or not you shouldn't do it, but, um, and that was exactly what I was doing um, on, a, on a headset that is essentially just a mobile phone <laughs> processor. Um, so that was quite interesting. It involved a lot of clever programming to make sure that things were kind of loading in the background and then unloading themselves, so I didn't overwhelm um, the memory of the of the device. Um, and this is uh, this is fellow, fellow I believe Cumbria is from Sheffield, uh, fellow Sheffielder. If I've got that wrong, I'm sorry. Um, Cumbria McCumbe, uh, his work I I um, really like. I really liked this piece of work. It's really cool. Um, and they're doing great things now as well. So I just wanted to show that. Uh, this is, you've already seen this image several times. Um, this was built in, this is actually built using a game engine that I wrote um, on top of 3GS, because 3GS is just a rendering engine. It will, it will render 3D graphics for you and that is it. It doesn't do anything else. Um, and this, I built a kind of, sort of pseudo uh, game engine on top, which allowed um, a high level of abstraction between game on objects and between uh, different interactions and so on and so forth. So it became very easy to build quite fast in yeah, these kind of pre-made scripts that you then built on top of um, that I've made and then an event system that kind of dealt with them all interfacing with each other without causing like mad conflicts, so, which allowed me to build this really quickly. Um, the game engine I'd actually developed for another project that I was commissioned to do of my own work, um, which was uh, which also had a multiplayer um, aspect. So this does actually have multiplayer capability in it too. Um, although, yeah, it's a complete headache, but anywho. <laughs> um, I also do a lot of physical stuff. Um, I really like being up a ladder or behind a wall, wiring something up in the dark. That's really enjoyable for me. Um, 
and this is kind of a recent really big project that I did uh, with Arbyte, um, this 360 projection room using very consumer level projectors, um, which involves some sort of fun engineering, building custom mounts that allowed you to shift the projectors and so on and so forth. And um, me uh, using two computers running After Effects at the same time to map all the projections. Definitely not the way you should ever do a 360 projection, but it worked really well and it was um, an interesting challenge. Um, and I worked for lots of other artists and galleries beside this, as well as kind of teaching programming too. But since I've only got four minutes and 20 seconds left, I'm going to move on to my own work. Um, I've been, I've, I've always been sort of really interested in technology. I'm a self-taught programmer and CGI person and so on and so forth. I've just, I think my main obsession is just learning how to do things, especially things that seem hard. Um, and uh, sort of doing stuff with coding is kind of just really sort of like fires my brain in quite a nice way. And really, int and I sort of my early work is very interesting. The kind of system of the net networks, kind of how things travel through it, and so on and so forth. And I think for a lot of um, kind of tech artists, programmer artists, that inevitably leads to kind of like well, what's happening, you know, at the physical terminals? Like, what? how does this kind of affect the real world? What happens in the real world once this stuff kind of goes to ground places? Um, and I think that kind of led me, so at first to making these very abstract technological works that are looking at kind of a holistic picture of, um, of the way the internet works, but then sort of led me out of there to a more sort of social history and history of of the internet and 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 the things that underpin it. Um, and this is the multiplayer game I was talking about before. That was that is um, a kind of based on a, a place in Sheffield, an area I grew up, um, in in which you're sort of like. Uh, dealing with like asynchronicity, which is an inherent thing kind of within programming, um, especially network programming. Um, but in this case, you're building cans, which you then leave for other players. Um, and this was running off a, because it's a multiplayer game, it's running off this server that I built on the left. Um, it's not anymore because I got kicked out of my studio where I had a port to the outside world, but you can still play it. Um, I've got it backed up somewhere else. Um, and I kind of continued down this sort of path where I think I think I overdid it on the code at some point and, and just kind of needed a break. Um, and at the same time, I was sort of getting more and more interested in less in the sort of shiny kind of superficial surface of a lot of the sort of um, technology we see around us and more in the kind of underpinning sort of histories and um, theoretical underpinnings and where they came from, which sort of led me back to Sheffield as a post-industrial city. It, very, it was very um, reliant on steam and, and I, I became quite obsessed with this because steam has, and the industrial revolution has such an effect on the social history of Sheffield um, and the identity of how people understand themselves um, and in, in a place that has historically experienced a lot of um, economic suffering and as a result, social suffering and how, and how the same thing that generated that also generated chaos theory, which became network theory and cybernetics and, and these things sort of kind of form these, these technologies that are perhaps quite exploitative and cause a great deal of harm to the environment and to people and um, and to people's sense of themselves um, then sort of form the bedrock of, of the kind of technological infrastructure we use to kind of frame our society now and, and, and how that might perhaps lead to sort of um, some complications. Um, so this work 
you know, it's not it's not as comp obviously computational as maybe some of the other stuff I've done, but it's just three Raspberry Pis that are all networked. Um, oh, that's me. Um, I'll finish my sentence, though. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, just three Raspberry Pis that are networked and they control little lights, the little 3D printed lamp posts light up and stuff. And, um, and, and this one of the warehouses splits in half and so on and so forth and videos turn on and off. And it, it, so there's nothing like, you know, it's, it's almost like being the opposite of, of kind of what we think of when we talk about technology, but there's, there is something kind of, analogous between this sort of like, I don't know, um, middle-aged man in a garden shed diorama kind of railway stuff and and the sort of modeling of AI and so on and so forth. They're both forms of models and in, in they, have, they share like a, a sort of um, kind of some of their space with each other and it's this obsession with like oversight and control and um, uh, and, and sort of mastery. Um, and I think I'll probably leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, and thanks to all the speakers. We have time for some questions. Um, yeah, so um, please, any questions for any of the three speakers? Or observations or your own experiences you want to share or um, thoughts that you have? Yes, please. Well, it's brilliant, brilliant what we're doing with. Can we make a living out of this? <laughs> Can you make a living out of it? Um, well, we've got actually, I mean, a researcher, artist, full-time artist, right? Danielle, you're a full-time artist. Yeah. And yeah, and, and, and Chris McKinnis here, who is artist and designer. So maybe who, who wants to answer? The question was, can you make a living out of it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, I think you can definitely make a living out of it. it I, at least for me, it's similar to making a living if, uh, as any artist. It's similar difficulties as well. Um, mm. And there's a lot of, especially in tech, there's a lot of, you're going to meet a lot of people that don't understand what you're talking about half the time, you know. And um, sometimes a lot of the work is selling an idea that people don't understand. Um, at least that I found personally is that like I have to talk about the idea in a way that makes sh make sure that everyone can understand it and it's about making sure that you're clear it's not about like it's it's not dumbing down anything at all it's just being clear in how you present your idea to someone because often with tech you need help to build it um, but also before when I wasn't I didn't have anyone to help me um, it was like one of the best things about making tech art for me was that I could put it online and it's always there for show forever. I don't have to rely on anyone to come and ask, do you want to show something? Because I had, I, I had started building websites using Twine, which is super easy um, to use. And it's my first program I started using, I think, um, to build games by myself. And so um, you can definitely make a living from it. It's, it's not... Um, I wouldn't say it's like it, just the easiest thing in the world, but I, I wouldn't say it's any harder than any other medium. It's just about knowing how to talk about your work and, and pitch it. That's the thing I really hate. You have to pitch it, at least that I found, like so much. Cause you're like, oh, I want to make an interactive podcast. <clears throat> like, oh, okay, cool. What's, what's that? What is that? And you're like, all right, okay. Uh, <laughs> and then you have to kind of like talk a lot about um, like a vision, selling a vision rather than when you have a painting, it sells itself because you can see it. But when you have tech work, you sell a vision of an experience, in my opinion. Yeah, I'd like to add also to, to this that it's interesting. I think within the media art world, obviously it is more challenging, I think a little bit more than normal uh, uh, fine artists, only because you need more resources. So that means actually, in general, you, you need tech, you need hardware, you need, so that means producing a, an artwork, it'll be, it'll be more expensive. 
um, unless it, you know that was why for example uh, in my case i always do things in open open source um and 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 you know obviously if you do everything digital that then it becomes really really cheap you know but i think um yeah it's challenging being an artist is challenging but we are all making a living from it so hey you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think that's right. So it's, I don't, know, I don't know if I'm just speaking for myself, but I think it's something that's changed post pandemic, whereas there used mm. to be media art used to be something that's so different to art, whereas now it's for once the big institutions are listening and they're actually almost nervous about kind of catching drift of, of what media art really is. And I don't, I, it feels like there's a new openness that at least fascinates me. I hadn't experienced that much mm -hmm. before. I think there's, I, for me, it feels like something seismic is shifting. I don't know. What, what do you say? That's mm. very interesting you should say that, Olive. And I was thinking also, particularly about Chris, the way he was talking, that this is extending the word hybrid much further. We're not talking about hybrid media anymore, about hybrid mind. Mm. Because Chris seemed to represent that kind of way that is no longer thinking like, I'm an artist, I'm an engineer, I'm a software mm -hmm. programmer, I'm this, mm -hmm. that or the other. Is, you know, I'm a model maker and I'm a bloke in a shed. <laughs> I like to, and making things that look like toy engines. But in all of these different facts, uh, you know, factors and facets of, of what intrigues him and, and drives him. And I, I find that fascinating because it seems to summarize and, and you know, kind of be a model of, of what hybrid should be. So when I see that, something that's going to be particularly <laughs> challenging for institutions to take on board because they're not comfortable with the idea of people coming out of the back room and announcing they've actually got something to say, because it, you know, like, there's a kind of, we're challenging a pecking order there as well, because Chris is both the, the, the technician who helps you do stuff, but he's also somebody with ideas of his own. So he, he might be the man at the front rather yeah. than the man in the back room. And then it extends to yourself, right? Yeah. But also to um, Danielle, to Maria, to Afro, we're all kind of programming, combining physical work with um, engineering, with um, artistic practice. And it's interesting that it connects back to this idea of Renaissance that you brought up, right? This idea of like the Renaissance man and that actually they're not necessarily different yeah. fields. We are the Renaissance people. <laughs> 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 Mm -hmm. Does Chris, do you have anything to, to say just on, did you, could you hear Paul talking then about yeah. on you? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, um, I mean, I, I think I should sort of simplify it a bit in a way because I, I, I don't make any money from my work. Um, and that's, you know, that's because that's for a, a multitude of reasons. Some of them are, you know, I don't have a very good attitude in terms of like, being a professional practitioner and some of them are uh i don't know i i i, I just struggle i've always struggled with it i'm i'm absorbed in the making and i i'm not good at the the marketing side and i think this being being a technician really solved a lot of problems for me where i i do need i i need to make money um, I don't have the sort of luxury of practicing without making some money somewhere and being a, a technician sort of a gets me out of the studio and stops me from going mental in the studio and B uh, makes has made um, working with technology very accessible because I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of not only am I getting someone else to pay for the technology, I'm also getting someone to pay me <laughs> for messing around with it and, and working with it. And, and, and it's kind of, I think, I think not, not everybody necessarily even wants to make money from, from their work. I, I certainly don't because I, I oh, because I, I don't, I know I couldn't deal with the pressure that comes with that. And, and the thing I'm thinking about most is like, how do I, how do I sort of sustain an art practice? And I think my feel, my sort of conclusion over the years has been that attaching um, my art practice to like a need to make money or satisfy other people's expectations in some way, um, whether that's real or imagined, is not a way for me to make my art practice sustainable. So I've kind of like split the two down the middle and and partition the money making side so yeah i, I suppose it, it is hybrid it is hybrid but it's also just like pure logistical sort of necessity 
Um, I've got a question to Danielle, actually, which is about archives. Um, I was wondering if um, your, your archive or your, your process in creating an archive, if you've been link, speaking to other people hosting an archive, or if there's been any interest by any institutions to embrace that? Because I feel from, um, you've been talking quite a bit about the need to be independent, to host your own domain. Yeah, I was wondering if, yeah, there's also maybe a need to interconnect or, um, yeah, to, to connect up with, with bigger institutions. I don't feel I need to do that. But um, yeah, uh, for this particular archive, I don't want to do that. I think it's important that the domain stays within the community and we own everything on there. So we know what's happening, what happened, how to fix it, or especially how to fix it because it's already been broken like 10,000 times. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, it's not, uh, It. W I didn't make it to, to sell it or to, to pass it on or something like this. I made it. For the community and the only thing we are doing with it is um doing dlc adding more things to it basically and going to different countries and um and just adding adding people because i just want to add more people and um and yeah the, like the archive taught me like a lot about uh, similar like not every piece you need to treat the same and some pieces are way more personal than others. And so this piece is like, I just, I add to it because I care about the people involved. And I don't think I did a good enough job the first time. So I want to do a better job now. And I want to remaster it and revisit everyone I archived in five years or 10 years. And so that I can remake the archive um, in the present and but re-follow up the lives I was trying to record. So maybe I would do a better job. Um, and, but I did speak to some other archives, like I spoke to the Digital Transgender Archives in America uh, to see how they were doing it and the problems they had and how, how good it was and all this kind of stuff and how they got funding because they get a lot of funding. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird one. It's a really weird one when, it, when you're making work that, because I feel like a lot of digital work sometimes has more than one me, one use rather than just being art. Um, and sometimes it has a larger use in the community than it does in the art world. And that's way better, uh, at least personally for me, I feel. I always say personally for me as if I'm hurting someone, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think we probably have to... Yeah, I've got, uh, yeah, I think maybe one, one more uh, question we can yeah. take. Yeah? Yeah, I have one question for you, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Could you describe a few examples of uh, metaverse galleries right, that you thought was interesting? Um, yeah. Just to get a little bit of an idea of what is going on in that world. Uh, yeah, I think um, it's we're going to what you were talking about, pitching the idea and you know selling a vision. It's very hard to explain when I can't just you know click click a link and show you mm. on the screen. But um, so how you can um, divide them. And I think some of the wrong ones, what they're doing now, because they finished showing the show, like the Biennale is finished, but what they have on the website, if you go to literally the wrong.org, uh, you would see that they have this sort of online version where they broadcast everything that was shown and some of them is meta are metaverse galleries. But the idea is that, um, so mention the artworks, some of them are just like, your normal art, some of the 3D sculptures, like what you did, right, with the performative art. And then instead of what I found that they, the artists don't like to put, or curators don't like to put borders, so that uh, virtual place with no borders, but with different textures for the ground, so it's not your normal cement or whatever, but it's like an interesting, I don't know, have you ever played No Man's Sky? <laughs> Do you know the... Or any space games. Oh, imagine yeah, a space yeah, game. Like yeah, so it is. And, it's yeah. the idea that you don't see a normal way of materials. So you don't see a normal white walls. You don't see um, a normal carpet, pavement, whatever is on the ground. So they play with the geometry because the rooms are weird. Uh, what also I noticed that when you talk about metaverse galleries, uh, it's that they don't really put your normal geometry like square is for the room it's more about like round geometry or the the rooms that 
do not hold the normal idea of physics. <laughs> and I don't know anything yeah. about physics, but <laughs> take my words for it. But mm. yeah, the idea is the very vivid shapes that go and then you have arts presented into them. And usually you have some overall idea of the gallery. One of them was uh, talking about the cyberspace and the idea that sort of a new society that can be built as a topier idea of the cyberspace. And then, you know, you enter that gallery, you don't see borders, you just see the ocean, but then the ocean is not the normal one. It's really out of polygon structures, you know, and then you walk and there is uh, in the middle the, the sphere and you talk with the sphere and it has the mechanical voice that leads you to another room and then you, communicate in another room with a hologram. Uh, <laughs> like almost mm -hmm. like you go through levels of the computer yeah, game. Exactly. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. that's I think what's going in. There are more and more of them. I wanted to also uh, mention to you when you were talking about net art, and I was, I was, uh, and you let you you finish your presentation with a question of like what it is net art for you, and and I've been and I wanted to share a couple of uh, I guess a couple of examples of of like I guess collective. Uh, digital creation and for me that was like I was thinking that's kind of like the ultimate net art because it's like people from different you have like people from different uh, places around the world that they are uh, connecting in the in the virtual online world yeah. and they are creating an artwork together and I've seen some great examples with like performance some other uh, great examples with uh, with kind of digital digital painting you know and I think I don't know like for me uh, actually like that, that, that's because maybe I don't think about it anymore as like something that is on the net. It has to be has to be created yeah. on the on the net for it to be net art. But yeah, I think, reflection. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. yeah, the what I think was, was very interesting about the criteria what we were saying. I, I don't. I think nowadays there are no more criteria. I think uh, Lev Manovich, who is the, also the on uh, media art, the, the writer and the professor, who's saying that he hates the idea of criteria, because why we always need to put everything in the, into the tick. And I think today mm -hmm. with the internet, because you know it's so globalized, we can go and jump on several ideas at once. I think this idea of that art is this, 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 and that, or I don't know, expression mm -hmm. is this, this, and that. I think that the idea of criteria is going away step by step. You can't have just you know a rule book that you tick and then it's like, okay, I have this and this and this, that's why it's net art. I have this and this and this, that's why it's performance art. Mm -hmm. I think everything is connected and that's where hybridity coming from. Mm -hmm. And I think hybridity is the next criteria. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also like when we you know, let's remember that uh, art is all about expressing, about freedom, and actually new mediums and media art allow us that, so we shouldn't be constrained, you know, I think yeah. it should be about expanding. But I think we does uh, for tonight, yeah. right? So we have to wrap up. Yes. I was wondering if we could bring the slides up one more time. Um, just for the last event. Yeah, for yeah. the last um, bits. So basically, we just wanted to invite you to explore the virtual exhibition um, as long as it's still up. So we're closing tonight, really. And so tomorrow is going to be the last day also for Exo Area. So if you have time to explore it, please feel free. A lot of the works that we've talked about are on there. Um, and also we wanted to invite you to please um, evaluate it and give us your feedback, what you think about it, if you think there's ways to improve it. So there's an um, evaluation um, survey that we have on Survey Planet. So um, if you can, it would really mean a lot to us if you were to just leave your um, notes there. So please feel free to use the QR code to um, give us your feedback. I'm just gonna leave it on for a second. <laughs> and then we've got more events coming up. So. Um, yeah, obviously uh, this has um, been a social, um, but we have our next event just around the corner. And yeah, maybe actually I'll hand over to, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, next event is with the National Gallery. Um, so we're finally going back into the space to do a um, physical event, um, but we are hosting a public live stream of that performance event because capacity is incredibly tight in the gallery, so we've only got 30 seats in there, so um, it's a very small space, so we would like to invite you to come to the live stream, um, so there'll be performances by Chematica, by Annalima Group, and also Augustine Lauder will be doing a 360 sound performance and exhibition as well um, there. 
And we also have um, a film event coming up at the Barbican Centre. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. Something about that? Yeah. So we have. Um, it's the first time Martin Plaxis Q18. A film event. Um, it's going to be for uh, uh, Barbican Centre, uh, celebrating an art exhibition by Caroline Cinema. And we uh, have called it uh, Radical Embodiment. And we are exploring the politics of gender and the kind of rituals of embodiment. And we are going to have a um, yeah an open call for uh, that uh, exhibition. We have one space and we want to open it up to yeah, upcoming artists. So, as also, I don't know if you want to. Oh yeah, no. Um, there's a second QR code. So this one is um, if you wanted to submit your work, or that students who might be producing work, um, animations, filmic work, specifically on the theme of radical embodiment, mm -hmm. gender, um, and yeah, performativity and ritual, mm -hmm. um, then please feel free to submit. There's also an exhibition that is coming up um, just after this at Ugly Duck um, on the 23rd, no, 24th of November is the opening day. Um, and this work could also will also be shown there. So please feel free to um, submit that. And yeah. we'd just like to say thank you all to you. For yes. Thank, thank you, you very much to the British Computer Society for hosting mm -hmm. us. Thank you very much for our fantastic speakers online. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, thanks for coming. I'm afraid that we don't have any more time for mingling. We have to leave the office. <laughs> <laughs> Just because last time we were late and we pulled off. So we're going to have good time today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.